Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everyone else. My name is Pat Nurse. I'm the creative director of the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our one o'clock session here on uh, day four of the online edition. Um, today we're going to be joined by Dan Hunter, or to think of it in a more fun way, we're going to be joining Dan Hunter Bray for a tour of uh, the Bray Farm where um, Dan and the Bray gang work their magic, I guess, in, in Birigo. Dan Hunter, can you hear me? Afternoon. Pat Howdy. Dan, is that, is that coming through? Yeah, I can, I, I can hear you, okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> All right. All right. Dan, for, for those of us who um, don't know Birigo or... Um, are yet to have the pleasure. Yeah, select few that don't know Birigar, I'm sure. Um, the the Paris of the Karangamite district. Tell us where we are. So we are, what, an hour and a half, an hour and a bit drive west of Melbourne. We're about 110 metres above sea level. We get what sort of rainfall? Well, that all depends, doesn't it, on the year these days. Uh, look, I think... We're sort of half a ton these days to maybe 800 mil in a great year now. I think it was very different sort of 30, 40 years ago, but at the moment uh, rainfalls are certainly decreasing, but then coming unexpectedly very strong at once. So anyway, we're, we're, we're sort of around 500 touch up, touch below each year at the moment. So And yeah, we're an hour far from the grand city of Melbourne in Western Victoria in a very, look, a very beautiful, uh, very active, uh, very nature-focused part of Australia, part of Victoria. Uh, and, yeah, the, the sea level meterage was of a great fact for us all to know and good to see you've had Wikipedia open. Um, I've been doing my research, Dan. Can I, can I, I know everyone's here to hear from you and to hear about Bray Farm. And I got yelled at by some people the other day for talking too much during Helen Goh's thing. But Wikipedia has just told me that Birigara was the site where the Henderson kids was filmed in 1985, 1987. A, a Logie winning show close to everyone's hearts here in Australia. That was possibly the debut for Ben Mendelssohn and Kylie Minogue. I think um, there's quite a few people, uh, let's say Gen X or older, hanging on to that fact as a highlight of their lifetimes. And there's certainly several people who who live in the town who, who in their eyes, start in the show, whether it be for a short scene or a full episode, but certainly quite famous down the, the local hotel and the hotels of the region for that fact. So, yes, uh, the main street was the the sort of backdrop to the Henderson kids. Um, not much has changed in that main street. Certainly, uh, Colin Minogue's no longer there and, and, and Ben Mendelsohn's developed his acting career a little bit further, but certainly uh, the, the, town, the town look is quite similar to what it was in, in we're talking the 80s. Um, but, you know, I it's... Mean, uh, it's I, was, uh, I, was, I mean, that, that was obviously a key attraction for you and Jules when you were looking to, to get a, a place of your own. But what were the other factors that attracted you to this, this site when you, when you was thinking about planting your stake there? Look, it was pretty long process actually to find somewhere as relevant and, you know, as rich as this for the, for the, in terms of what we required to run this type of restaurant and the type of restaurant that we wanted to run and, and around, um, albeit when it opens. Um, essentially, look, about four years prior to coming here, we, we basically did a, a ring around Melbourne on a map in the old school days when you had a map on the floor and, and got um, at 150 kilometres and basically made an extraordinary list of, of all the things that would be required to, to actually sink our own money into something. Um, and they range from, obviously... You know, TV dramas, the Henderson Kids, the one, uh, but also to, you know, not being in the main street of the town, but certainly being close to a town, being in an agricultural area, being in an area which is quite 
flexible and open to the concept of, I guess, organics and, you know, uh, certainly, let's say, more forward-thinking agriculture, um, close to the ocean but not at the seaside. Um, you know, the airports are, are close and they needed to be close in a sense under a couple of hours and both international and domestic air, air ports are close to, to Biri. Um, so, yeah, so it was a pretty long list and, and we did actually look at lots and lots of places um, in lots of different parts of Victoria, all under that 150 kilometres and, and nothing really stood out as much as, uh, as Birigara, but certainly nothing stood out in terms of a property um, as much as what was then called Sunny Bray and is now Bray um, when it came on the market. And look, there's obviously been lots of work to do since then and there was a lot to do at the time and, and I don't feel as though it's work that's completed. I think when you own a piece of land, particularly what agricultural values and, and you know, you're, you're invested in agriculture, um, it's ongoing. It never, it never actually changes. And I mean, even standing right here, obviously haven't had many Instagram conversations on this path and hopefully you can see the restaurant in the background. Um, but, you know, seven years ago, uh, this was a grassed area and there was none of these plants apart from this apple tree. Um, there's nothing else here. So everything you see here in the native gardens here is all under seven years old. And I was thinking today we'd take a little bit of a walk to some other parts of the property and probably go through some of the things we've been doing not only in lockdown and, and preparing for an opening at some time, but certainly to discuss and have a look at things that we have done in the last seven years, um, which, geez, I tell you what, we've made lots of mistakes. And as I say, it's ongoing. Um, I'm not a farmer, that's for sure, but um, getting my head around some, some concepts. And certainly there's lots of things to be proud of here as well. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's ongoing. We'd certainly prefer to have customers to help us to, and, and hopefully that's just around the corner for most of us you know and and whatever that means i guess we'll just take that one day at a time but certainly um yeah being on the property at this time of year uh, i won't lie it is rather brisk today uh, we have had several days of a very fine weather and and it's not raining just yet but it's certainly it's certainly cold enough um but you know this time of year's a a time of year for sort of doing the job to separate the seasons, you know, taking things out of beds and stuff things for, for spring and later in winter and, and taking care of plants and fertilising. And when I say fertilising, where it be planting green manure crops or spraying out liquid fertilisers of seaweed and worm casings, for example. Um, it's a time for that and it's also a time for well, at the moment, it's a time for menu planning and looking what we'll have in a month to six weeks and we hope to reopen. So, um, yeah, I mean, we should probably go for a bit of a walk. And But please, I don't know if the wind is causing any issue. If it is causing any issue, we can have a look at that. But if you want to just pop in with any questions along the way, we'll just have a little bit of a walk around the property and, and hopefully right, cool. keep the communication going. And if I, if I see any questions that are written in a language other than emojis, uh, I, will, I will share them with you. At the moment, there's a lot of love hearts and waving. So, Any of those ones yet? Not yet. Not yet. So can we, can we see a bit of 420, please, people? Jules is actually uh, acting as um, chief of production today. So rather than holding the, the phone myself, hopefully she's going to follow, much in the same way that we would hope to take guests around when when they're on the property uh, and we can just have a look at what's going on. So uh, again, if that becomes difficult, I can take over, but I think this is the best option at the moment. Let's give it a go. All right. So yeah, I mean, look, to start with, I mean, as I just said before, this is, uh, this is the entrance to the restaurant. Um, and Bray, roughly 24 acres. Um, a lot of it, dedicated to to growing things for the restaurant um but also lots of native plants and i guess in a sense when you have an organic system uh one of the things that you do need to have is diversity of plant life and not just edible plants but certainly lots of uh lots of compatible plants and and you know things that bring in insects or house bird life frogs anything that creates diversity um, 
and obviously being at Bray, we want people to feel as though it's a, very much an Australian experience. Um, and so we've had a real effort around the restaurant to make sure that a lot of the plantings are native to Australia and uh, give a real sense of where you are, you know. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, we've done in, I guess, the last six or seven years is is different areas in the farm with different types of plantings. And the first place we're going to go today is one of the citrus or the citrus orchards that we have, citrus grove. Um, it's roughly 65, 70 different citrus trees. Um, and ranging from, you know, the standard Tahitian lime you might find in a bar and, you know, Lisbon lemon, quite typical in Australia, through to, um, I don't know, yuzus, uh, kinoto oranges, uh, Australian limes as well, some finger limes and uh, blood limes as well. And, yeah, I guess this is, um, I've got to be honest, this is one of the this is one of the places I am quite proud of at this point property because in the first uh in the opening opening week or two when this was all pretty much leveled and there was none of these plants are actually grown yet and i'd put a few citrus trees here and i obviously got hammered by the weather and quite a uh i don't know not the best probably not the best siding for citrus at the time without any coverage and obviously citrus plants require some shelter and this was very exposed to the southerly winds. And um, I remember the first couple of months, a couple, you know, some, a group of people ate in the restaurant and a woman sort of um, pretty much dragged me out by my ear, asked to speak to, asked to, speak to Dan and, and explained to me that she was a horticulturalist and her specialty was citrus. And <laughs> for planting citrus, such a terrible place. And how, you know, like, don't you know anything about this sort of thing? Like, there's no way these plants are going to grow. Uh, they don't have any shelter. Citrus need warmth. They need some, maybe some warm bricks. I could certainly help you with that. And, of course, I was, you know, took it on board and was sort of pretty devastated at the time because a lot of stress happening in a restaurant. Um, but now when I come here, I sort of think, I wish you'd come back now because have a look at this now. And, and basically, um, you know, it's a citrus forest here now, you know. Hey, Dan, we've got a couple of questions on the citrus front. Uh, yeah. One of the questions is, do you have any calamansi? No. <laughs> well, you need to address that. Otherwise, the uh, Filipino Australians in the audience are going to give you some we'll stick. And, and what's, your, uh, what's your preferred citrus? Preferred citrus? I mean, I, I'm a bit of a citrus fiend, to be honest. I think, I think one thing that's constant uh, it, at Bray is always... And you know when you when you when you're putting something together, a dish together, or tasting something, and your mind sort of goes, you know, what does this thing need? I'm always like, oh, I just need a bit of citrus. You know, we always joke in the kitchen that, you know, in the old school sort of French days in Melbourne, everything was like a pinch of cayenne, and that this kitchen's like everything's like a little bit of little bit of citrus zest, or a little little squeeze of citrus. And I mean, thankfully, you know, in this climate, we get. Lots of trees that produce twice a year. Um, and citrus, it's a funny thing. You know, it's one of those things that typical in Australia, you know, someone has a, you know, the suburban backyard always has a citrus tree in it. And, uh, you know, you sort of grow up with, with that, you know, free lemons or lemons for 20 cents at the, at the door and that type of thing. And now they're, you know, stupid prices. But, you know, one of the things here is, I guess, and what you notice, even when you grow something as not mainstream, but as, as normal, let's say, as a, a lemon, is that a fresh lemon or a lemon in its season that hasn't been refrigerated or put, you know, stored, has the most intense, ridiculous flavour. Um, and we should be using those things in season as well. You know, they have a couple of seasons. You can almost get citrus for a lot of the year off a really established tree. But something as basic as a lemon is not just a throwaway ingredient. And I guess that's one of the things about having such diversity in this orchard here is, is allowing those ingredients to have their moment, but also allowing them to be the best they can be and harvesting them 
and using them fresh. I mean, a GNT Bray, I reckon, is pretty good because generally the lemons have come off the off the tree in the morning. Um, and you know, like we've grown finger limes for a couple of years now, and really this year is the first year that they've they've produced well, <laughs> just when we closed. Um, and so, you know, I think even something like that to be able to grow to grow finger limes in this climate down here, obviously on a grafted tree, but uh, it's just something so different to have to have something as basic as citrus, you know, freshly harvested new. So my favourite citrus, to cut a long story short, would be at times the Lisbon lemon, very fragrant, typical lemon, fantastic in a gin and tonic. Obviously, uh, native finger limes are, have their own value and, and very uniquely Australian, and, and when you take them, uh, they very much put you in a place. Uh, uses, a bit hard to grow. We've got some Canotto oranges which haven't ever fruited yet, but they're getting close, and I'm looking forward to that because, you know, obviously sour oranges are great. We might start making some Amaros or something other than that. Um, and blood lime. I mean, you know, something... The blood lime's a funny thing. We've got some blood limes here and there. They're a hybrid lime. They're 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 a cross between, I think, a what is it, a, a rampurine lime and a finger lime. The rampur lime was a cross originally between a mandarin and a citron. So you know that's a really interesting fruit that's very typical to here. And I guess the interesting point of that is the 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 hybridisation or the or the cross pollination of of citrus to make something which is uniquely of a place and new. And that's not to be confused with, um, you know, let's not confuse that with, with GM foods or something like that. I mean, that's just uh, that's a basic way that seeds have always been, you know, established and made and, and, and cross pollinated over time. So um, taking the best of one variety and crossing it with the best of another variety to make a new variety over several seasons until that new variety then seeds and you've got opportunity to have that fruit in its own right in that case. Um, yeah, hey, Dan, I was just yeah. going to chime in. I just remember um, name drop a lot alert here, talking to Magnus Nilsson a few years ago, and he was saying, look, you know, there's a lot of, um, I, I remember you, you, you guys are quite particular about saying that, you know, Bray is not a garnish and uh, herbal tea huh. garden. You know, this is a farm, you know, you are, you are, producing the things that go center plate and magnus said something similar he said you know like it's there are the sexy things there are the you know the finger limes and the green almonds and those cool things but like you were saying about the lemons it's important to remember that the potatoes and the onions and those sort of workhorse ingredients make a difference as well they make they are the difference so they don't make the difference yeah. there. That's the difference, you know, and I guess, um, yeah, I mean, really one of the things that we've been really particular about, and for me, the whole reason for being in this project, so to speak, is, is the ability to grow. And look, it's not to grow the, the ingredient that no one has, it's not necessarily to grow the, the fancy or the, you know, the old, oldest, rarest, whatever it is, and produce five of them and never really use them on a table. It's to produce food that's, that's raised organically, that's nutrient dense. So, you know, I, I'm of the opinion, I feel quite confident in saying this, is that when you eat a menu of Bray, of course there's the luxury of, of being here and there's the, you know, there's the decadence hopefully and the, and the, you know, the party if you're celebrating something. But I think at a very basic level, the effort that we've put into consuming is, is actually healthy on some regard. It seems ridiculous to say I went to Bray and oh, gee, it was healthy. Um, but subliminally, so because I had, you know, four bottles of wine and it wasn't, but, but subliminally, in a sense, uh, 
and it's not something necessarily that we probably bang on about, but I know for myself is, you know, I have a nine year old daughter and if she eats the food from here, I want her to be, want her to be healthy. And if, you know, when you're working with your team, when you're having, you know, 10 family meals a week and you're using food off the property, well, you, it's, you want it to be healthy. You know, you want it to provide some nourishment and, and sustenance and not just be package of water or a package of starch it doesn't really translate to any health property you know so you know like i guess um i mean we've started growing grain in the last couple of years and, and maybe we'll take a walk over to the grain paddock but you know like i'm not a great grain farmer i'll tell you that straight up like the first season we had an amazing result the second season not so good we're at the start of the third season now and we just we just sowed some wheat uh two weeks ago and thankfully this year we sowed it in warm weather and got bits of rain afterwards. Last year it was in quite wet, cold weather and, and the result was a weed full of paddocks and a little bit of grain, uh, a paddock full of weeds and a little bit of grain. A weed full of paddocks. Now that is a concept. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, I don't know. It's just um, when you're growing food with the outcome of being productivity or having a, 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 a result that, that's large quantity, uh, sometimes it might be easy to get miss on the fact that well, lots and lots and lots of bad food is just still it's not very good food, you know. Like I'd rather have a small amount of high quality, extremely healthy, raised in a manner which is that we're proud of. Uh, and then hopefully, and I'm confident it does, it translates to flavour because nutrient-dense food it does taste better, you know, it's, it's, it's flavoursome. So, so here, I mean, look, this is, this is a 10 acre, this is the 10 acre paddock that, um, that we've been working with over the last seven years, a few years just grazing with sheep. Uh, and recently the last three years, um, having a crack at growing some different grain crops and we've grown, uh, wheat and spelt and, you know, the wheat being for flour that we use in the kitchen. Um, most recently, from the very first season of wheat, we just made a, a wheat beer with prickly moses. Um, and that's going to be, that's going to be at Bray when we reopen. And we should have it on site in the next week or so, actually. Um, so using organic wheat from this, from this field and then using only Victorian uh, ingredients and making a, a sort of a session wheat beer because, you know, you know, you need a session beer. Um, and so that's sort of exciting. And, yeah, I guess, um, you know, looking at this now, and there's probably some grain farmers, because I'm sure they're tuning in too, um, looking at this and looking at like a paddock full of weeds and grass. And I guess if you can see out there, uh, there's a darker sort of cultivated section. There's a grass section on the other side. And the grass section is a section of the paddock which we've had a lot of issues with. And this year... Um, We've introduced uh, broad beans and uh, deep, almost like a daikon, um, and some loosened, uh, along with a little bit of wheat as well. And the top here is just clover and, and wheat. And there's a concept, a lot of the stuff I've been looking into and reading about recently, and, and hopefully um, we'll see some results, is in increasing biodiversity in the soil and increasing, I guess, organic matter, but not by adding it to the top as a compost, but adding it to the soil as living plants. And obviously living plants, they have different compounds. They do different things in the soil. They might draw up more minerals. They might provide nitrogen. They might provide carbon. And I guess in a healthy ecosystem where you're growing quality food and the sort of food you want to grow in the restaurant, you require all of those things to be available to plants to give the nutrients. And you What's your soil all... profile, Dan? Uh, pretty shit, actually. <laughs> to be honest, like it's quite a sandy. It's clay. It's there's quite clay on around the your region, isn't it? We we have a, we have. It's really funny because I guess the reality of of growing things on a property is understanding all the different square meterage of that property. You know, so there's parts of this property which are super dense clay, uh, and there's parts that are absolute you know, lifeless topsoil, sandy topsoil, you know, and, and I guess... We were, um, with, we were with Mauro Colagreco on this very telephone like two days ago in his, and his is more of a kitchen garden. It's like a stepped sort of arrangement in, in the south of France. But he said, 
over here, we can grow bananas. Like this, this couple of square meters here is basically tropical. Nowhere else in the garden can do this. You know, like just from yeah, meter I'm to meter, it's changing, changing, changing. I was actually longing for the weather that he was showing you on that, on that conversation, actually. Um, it was killing me. It look, was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. I mean, look, it's, yeah, so this is, this is hopefully an ongoing project and we intend it to be, I guess, like what we've done on many other little parts of the property um, is really, really try to introduce multi-species, uh, have a, a full environment, a system that's like diverse from a biological point of view, that's working together, not against. And you know, look, look grain farming, it's it's pretty it's pretty full on. Like you're taking a lot, you take a lot out of the ground, you know. So to to be using synthetic fertilizers only, which we don't, and to be or to be using chemicals on land which we absolutely don't um, and to be expecting that the food that you produce because you can produce food in quite bleached soil it will grow mm. but do you want that like do you do you want to eat that and do you expect to eat that in like one of our best restaurants like because that's the other thing i mean you know i know there's a premium to eat at our restaurant i know that there's a dollar value which is which is perhaps beyond many and you know, I can respect that people think that's probably ridiculous sometimes because it's food. But, but you know, when you take into account labour, but obviously you also take into account ingredients and actual effort that goes into those ingredients and the long-term, you know, projects to make those ingredients available. I mean, you know, I'm looking at the bottom of this paddock now thinking, well, that's sort of off the cards this year. And, and so it should be because it needs to rest. But not just resting it to to let it just go to go to waste, but actually planting straight into the ground without turning the soil and and introducing multi 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 species of plants to hopefully at the end of that cycle have the ability to have all that living matter in the soil and then produce a crop next year that warrants its place in a restaurant like ours, you know. So and to be very proud of that. So yeah, I mean that's. Let's wait and see. I mean, at the moment, there's, a, there's lots of weeds. They're a part of life in an organic system. Uh, I certainly tip my hat to lots of serious organic growers that grow on a larger scale that have these beautiful looking, super rich, dark chocolate soils. And that's, you know, that doesn't happen in a month, a year, a season. That's like, you know, you're talking, you're talking five, six, ten years to like, fully being committed to that process and understand that you'll have failures in that time um, to get to that point where now you just have mega crops and you just have the highest quality food. And I guess what that's what we're hoping for, you know. We're certainly out here, we're hoping for that. All right, let's go somewhere else. What do you what do you do for pest control, Dan? We've had a question from the audience. Yeah, uh, pest in what I suppose it's Pests, funny, funny subject, pests. I mean, pests are, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say we've had necessarily pests in that paddock, for example. We certainly have pests, uh, if that's what you like to call them, in the veggie garden at times. And, and we use very hands-on methods. If they're snails, you pull them off. Uh, if they're, you know, in this region, Western Victoria, there's lots of, uh, lots of large scale and GM as well, uh, brassica growers. So whether it be rapeseed or, you know, even further to canola and, and they attract a similar moth. And so you get that sort of white, that white moth at certain times of year. So if you're planting your brassicas too early in summer, uh, when they're growing those crops, you get these huge amounts of moths. It's, you almost have to check out what your neighbours are doing and, and check out in quite a large radius what people are growing and make sure you're not planting things too early based on that. And then covering, we use a lot of netting. We net the hell out of anything that's from the brassica family. When we go to the garden, you'll see some of that. Um, I think organics, again, pests are a funny thing. Having, having 
biodiversity is a situation which decreases pests. There's no doubt about it. Like having multi, multi species means that there's a place for somewhere to live and there's a place for someone, you know, there's food for something else that might come in. And, and I guess we really, really try and work on that, on that sort of scenario where we try and have multi species around the species that might be infested and hopefully we attract beneficial insects um, that might do the work for us. And I think you always have to understand that in a in an organic system there's no there's no way of, you know, avoiding it one hundred percent. And you know, I guess you know we get confused. We think that we think that farming is uh, these super neat rows and the soil's all been turned over and there's one species growing. Well it's that type of farming that's probably resulted in many of the bugs coming to a certain place and, and causing issues, you know. Diverse multi species farms have less have less issues. And they might not have it for a few years, but if they can if you can stay with it, uh, eventually eventually have some good times and have some issues sort of decrease, you know. Um all right, so wait, what's the time? What's the time? How's the time going, Pat? You're good. It's half past one. We've got twenty nine minutes left. No problem. So I guess uh, you know we didn't really didn't really sort of discuss it, but Bray essentially is twenty four acres, twenty three twenty four acre farm, um, and obviously that includes you know the restaurant, our office building. Um, there's a little bit of live agriculture right there for you. That's live agriculture. Um, that's Ian. Ian's uh, works as part of the garden team a couple of days a week. Yeah. Completely ignored you there. <laughs> and actually what he's doing is onto that onto that grass area of the of the paddock we're just in. Um, we've recently recently just put the broad bins in um, as a nitrogen fixer and essentially we didn't turn the soil we didn't think it was wise to tear up the soil and disturb the earthworms and all the effort we've been putting in and so we graze sheep on that part of the property on that part of um, of the paddock and just this week there's some other things going some loosen and radish and so we're basically mowing it to a mulch to make a ground cover um, and hopefully the other plants will get up a bit quicker than the grass grows and, and hopefully those plants will then knock out the chance for that grass to survive. And we'll see how we go in sort of six, you know, six to nine months from now. But essentially Bray is a 24 acre property. There's 10 acres that we just discussed on uh, for grain and cropping. Um, and then Aside from that, we have the restaurant, you know, our tool shed, our, our tractor shed, um, the car park, we have some accommodation, and then some dams where we collect water, rainwater for the irrigation, we irrigate completely off rainwater, um, and then the gardens, and really, we have a couple of orchards, we obviously went to the citrus orchard, we have a, an orchard which is sort of a newer, Orchard, orchard has been put here in our time, so in the last last sort of five years. Um, and that's a mix of, of things from different types of berries, uh, yoster berry, blackberry, brambles, uh, boysenberries, blueberry, raspberry, and then into some fruit trees, um, pears and apples. You know, and it's again, it's like the workhorse thing. Um, one of the things I've been really focused on is, is growing lots of fruit trees. Because I think as much as we love the, you know, the, the rare radicchio or the, you know. The thousand dollar peas. Yeah, all this stuff, you know, the, the, well, basically, I was, we've got some lagrimas growing actually. I know, um, I know. So and they're, they're actually back there, they're on the ground and kicking off and getting ready for sort of springtime. Um, but, you know, I think we forget sometimes the 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 pleasure and the, the importance of like really good fruit. And I, I sort of doubt whether many people get the chance to actually eat a piece of fruit. Like if something is, 
let's say benign as an apple, you know, like something which is just like, we sort of write it up as a school lunch sort of thing, you know, or the bruising in the bottom of the school bag. But, you know, a f- perfect apple, even even varieties that we're... Like a sort of pink lady apple. Grown organically and eaten off the tree. It's insane. Like, it's insane. It's it's, And it's something which... You know, I think a restaurant that grows food, I think people don't people probably don't understand that the majority of food that we grow is actually fruit on this farm, you know. This year we had pear trees produce pear trees producing like, you know, two hundred and fifty, three hundred and fifty, four hundred kilos of fruit off a six year old tree. Um, I tell you what, when you're not open and you've got six hundred kilos of fruit off a tree, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but I'm apparently famous for this Tartan now, um, because we picked fruit eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago off a pear. You pick the pears green, they they don't bless, but they they ripen off the tree. And on Saturday will be the last ten tartans from pears off this property, and we've had like you know nine weeks of, of pears off the off the dozen or so varieties of pears that we grow here. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been really, really focused on on growing, not just the bizarre or the freaky, you know, like just the standard, the the, the really great pear, the beautiful apricot, the peach that you eat warm, lots of nuts, almonds, pistachios grow on this property. We're lucky to inherit some established pistachio trees. Um, and I guess I will point out that you know on the property when we when we took over, which was in 2013, there was there was something going on, obviously. There was a, a restaurant of some notoriety for some period of time, Sunny Bro, and uh, there was some established orchard. There's an orchard here of about 40 fruit trees and an olive grove of about 100 trees, and we're very lucky to inherit those things. And on those trees, there's some insane fruit, and they're established trees that have been treated organically for some period of time, from figs to pistachios to medlar, you know, like this medlar tree here, um, pomegranate. And really amazing types of plums, but in addition to that, we've probably added about about 200 fruit trees, if not more, 250 fruit trees in that time. Um, and most of those are now fruit in really in abundance. You know, most of those are really starting to fruit. Actually, Glenis here is one of our garden team as well, and she's actually doing um, the annual pruning of this of this orchard, the more established orchard, obviously. Um, the younger trees will probably wait till a bit later in the season, but this, uh, these trees pruning a bit earlier, so pruning in order, um, and hopefully, you know, to, to allow for more energy towards fruit uh, in the coming in the coming year. Um, so yeah, so look, you can see here, um, there's only one or two trees now with nets on. This whole area is netted over summer, uh, and is prolific. Uh, amounts of plums um, and you know like I said before a pistachio like I'd never eaten a fresh pistachio to, until taking over this property and you know it's just it's not a kitchen job that the chefs you know they don't love it they don't love peeling pistachios off the tree but the fake and I think again we have this I don't know a misconception of what food tastes like like a, a fresh pistachio it tastes as green as it looks, you know, like it has full herbaceous notes and it has the flavour of the timber, of the wood, you know, it has the flavour of the earth around it. And if you told someone that a nut tastes like timber and, and you know, like resin, it just wouldn't make any sense because for most people, the stuff there was a roasted thing that you, you know, you do that with, with beers, you know. Like it's very different. So again, again, wanting to, wanting to grow and, and see the food that's... Um, in its best possible light. Question from the audience, Dan. Do you plant for the menu or do you write the menu based on the plants? Uh, the trees, we obviously plant for the long term and hopefully as they start to develop, we know they're available every year. But having said that, um, who doesn't grow like that? Trees don't grow the same every year and some years they don't grow at all and some years they get a you know, we you know, we're talking about pests before. One one of the pests that we do have and that is an issue often on fruit trees 
is uh, the cherry slug or, you know, pear slug. Um, and I guess what we try and do is, is over the winter is, is probably cover the ground uh, and sort of bury them in because they tend to drop off in winter and then they'll climb up the trees in the warmer months. And they'll take out a whole tree in no time. They'll just completely make a tree look like it's rotting. And we've had real issues with that over time. But we've also found that, um, you know, by, by being careful around the plants, by, by putting some, um, you know, some weed matting down around the plants and mulching around the plants, we've been able to stop them in most areas. Um, they won't have been gone forever, um, but certainly uh, we've found some success with that. The, so yeah, I mean, you know, this, this property has been sort of on the, on the growing side of things in, in our time. We've, we've planted so much and have been waiting for it to come to fruition and, and seeing each, each year the way it changes and the way it's um, becoming more established or becoming more mature and then being able to rely on those fruit trees. Like, you know, like what I said about the pears, last year we just didn't have that. Like well, last year the there wasn't a pear on the property and this year there's just tons of pears. So whether it's, it's just a good season or it's hit a mature stage that we can rely on that is probably a little bit each way. Um, so knowing that going forward, we'll, we'll probably plan for, for certain types of fruit in certain seasons. You know, we have accommodation here, so we do often use a lot of fruit in the, the sort of food offering that we do in the rooms. Um, and then I guess the vegetable garden, well, yeah, that you sort of plan, you plan that based on what you hope to cook. And in that sense, I tend to work um, with Nina, who's our sort of full-time gardener here. Um, and we have, a, we have a system of looking at what's available a couple of seasons ahead. We document what's grown well each season. We keep a record of everything that's going in. We, Nina writes a weekly report on the whole garden, every single bed, what's growing well, what stages is it at, what's coming up. We keep records, we keep daily records about the weather, the wind direction. Uh, any information is valuable for improving what we do. And of course that helps. And of course that also at times we have disasters. It's just like, that's, that's nature, you know. Um, but what I, what I guess, what I've found sort of works well for me is to just surround myself with as much as possible. So almost like going to a live market, you know, like it's, I don't, I don't, I'm not walking through the, through the rows of the big market and, and picking out things I see in a box and going, Oh, I'll do something with that. But rather, you know, plan the garden, get everything in the ground, know what I like and dislike, know what works well in our climate and in, what successes we've had and then try and build dishes around that. I'm not so much as building dishes around technique. It's more about uh, letting the ingredients sort of speak to me in a sense. And also mm. you know, the luxury of being here every day and, and occasionally discovering new things you didn't expect, like eating, eating a strawberry and a broad bean at the same time because that's on your path back to the kitchen and thinking – or smelling the fig tree as you walk past it while eating those things and, and thinking to yourself, shit, that's, uh, that's something I could never imagine, but it actually works and we should do something based on that, you know? And, mm. and I find that that's probably the best thing for me to do, to just basically surround myself, you know? We'll take a quick walk through the, to the polytunnel um, and then we'll go over to the vegetable garden and then we'll probably be getting close maybe. We had another uh, another question there, Dan. What sort of uh, percentage of the restaurant's need for fresh produce can you can you handle from your own production? It's a classic question, isn't it? So that's the um, it's the and is that is that is that your goal? I mean, that's my sort of supplementary question. Yeah, I mean, look. It's like, it's like saying, how hot was it this summer? Or, uh, you know, did we get the rainfall we required? Like, it's always, every single season is different. And we have temperature restraints. Uh, and we have 
uh, weather we can't predict. Anyway, I don't think you can find me, try and find somebody who can predict weather in, in southern Australia today or anywhere in the world. I mean, we have Australia's in a, having a bit of an issue there with our, you know, climate change having real issues for, for people growing food in particular. Um, so in a great season, in a summer, in our, in our strongest point, and I'd say the, the best time for us production-wise in a typical year, if there was such a thing, would be the late summer um, where there's autumn food growing and there's the, the remains of summer really kicking off. And I think, you know, summer for us, people associate a tomato with December. I look at a tomato and think, okay, March, April, May, you know, like mm. it's it's that time. And, and so what what we may consider is this, the, what we think is summer vegetables, we tend to find them at their best at the end of summer if we don't just get obliterated with a, a heat wave in, in February, which can happen, obviously. At that time, there's been most years when we can grow, you know, into the 90% of, of what we serve vegetable-wise. And, and also in that same period, just churning like jams and preserves and, and like fermentations and things for later in the year and things for the rooms. And from that same type of summer, we'll still be serving in October or November product that's been treated, uh, you know, at the end of summer, whether it be a vinegar or a mustard or a condiment or a fermentation of some sort, still, you know, still from summer. So in October, November, at the start of the next sort of warmer part of the year, we're still pulling out jars of fermented pumpkin from this time of year, you know. So um, it's quite ridiculous how much you can produce. And then always for us, it was an issue to grow in winter. Um, but we've found with the improvement in our organic matter in the soil and the, the improvement in the, the diversity of the, of the, I guess, the plant life and stuff in the garden, we're getting... We're getting winter crops now, which I never imagined in this area. We're getting, you know, we're getting brassicas and cabbages and, and still root vegetables got in early and, and sort of producing later into the winter. Um, we would still think it would be sort of 50 to 60% of what we serve in the restaurant. And I don't know, I don't, I guess the beauty of this type of restaurant and having a garden is, is having the accessibility to the different life cycles of a plant and not just thinking that the carrot is the hero or the or the tomato is the moment you know like seeing seeing something grow and getting not only the root the stem the leaf the flower it dies you've got the seed you know all of that thing that if you just shop in a market you only get what the farmer thinks is the cash crop you know you just get the thing that weighs the most and is sort of, you know, in the recipes. Whereas here, we can write the recipes based on the plants and we're always eating the food. Like we, we harvest the food whilst eating it. Um, and often things are going off and it's like, oh, we can do it. We can do a dish around that part of the, we can use that part of the plant as, as an element to something else. You know? So um, one of the benefits of having, having, a, having a farm and growing food is, is seeing and understand the life cycle of the food and making it appropriate to your cuisine in a way. Um, I was just going to show something here quickly. Um, just some, what looks like, uh, just some things ripped out of the, out of the ground here. And um, so these are, these are large chicory, very bitter leaf, a bit over the top actually, not, not, not much joy actually in a, in a big, chicory of this size unless you're going to you know cook it down and put in a bitter leaf pie or something i'm sure there's lots of people who think it was amazing but it, it can be pretty intense and um but what we tend to do at this time of year is is grow them over summer to a, a, a quite a substantial size where the root structure is huge and the plant still got lots of life in it and then take that plant and then bury it uh in some boxes in the hothouse here um, and shut the light away. And when the new growth appears, we get the forced chicons or, or very blonde chicories and, and white leaves. And um, 
of course they have the they have the bitterness still of the original plant because it because we haven't done it from seed they're established so they have some real balls to the flavor but the the sweetness that comes through from shutting the light away and obviously the aesthetic of this really beautiful you know quite beautiful white leaf um with strains of pink through it um it's really quite stunning so this is a little project that um this is summer chicory grown from last year grown quite big we'll take the leaves we'll use those and then dig up the roots and then re-sow them into the into boxes in the hothouse where they'll stay warm um and they'll have humidity uh, but they just won't have the light um but because they've got some uh, some biology they don't just die in the in the you know in the darkness polytunnel they're the same the whole world over <laughs> They're actually quite, it's quite warm in here today. Um, we've taken the covers off from summer so the light gets in, the winter light. And really, look, it's probably, it's just disgusting with Nina, our garden morning that, you know, there's not a lot in the polytunnel at the moment. So, um, you know, obviously looking at Maros um, and Renee's, uh, you know, the discussions you had with those guys and seeing their the beautiful spring gardens at the moment, and obviously, the south of France, it's probably as good as any of our summers at this time of year. Um, and just seeing the abundance. And really, we're seeing the opposite here. We're seeing the time of year shut everything down. Um, and everything that we have at the moment for spring uh, and winter is in the ground. The spring things are growing. Broad beans are growing. growing. Um, all of our winter brassicas, cabbages and things, they're, they're well and truly in the ground and, and producing. And so, not a lot. We've got a little section here where we, we try and continue to grow some herbs and things uh, through winter. Um, but then in terms of propagation and, I guess, seedlings and, and getting things going, most of this stuff is all things that will be used in the garden in, in winter already. They're, they're just things that we're... The succession plants, all the stuff that's here is already in the garden. And what we'll do, we'll let that get to a size. We'll start harvesting that, and these things will follow behind, and and therefore we'll have um, yeah, we'll just have a succession of those things. And I mean, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be open by then, and we'll be start to eating some of those things as well. Fingers crossed. Dan, we're we're edging into our sort of last eight minutes. Should we should we wander over to the vegetable garden and take a, a quick look around there? I have to say, Jules, a, a, a couple of people have commented it's really great when you can when you've come in on those close ups of the things Dan's talking about as well. It's really nice to see the plants. It's it's awesome. I'm missing quite a bit of that, Pat. What'd you say then? Oh, I was just saying it was great seeing those close-ups of things that like the chicory as well. It's really, really incredible. Yeah, the chicory, I mean, you know, it's, again, it's not just about, I, I think, I think maybe, I don't know if it's overlooked, but maybe it's not given credit to, but, but growing, growing food for, for markets or growing food for, you know, on a mass scale or whatever it is, uh, these aren't, these aren't people who, who wish they had a different profession. These are people, you know, sustaining and feeding our societies and building our restaurants and, and all that type of thing, you know. So it's a real skill and it's not an art, it's a science. And there's also, when you're growing food for, I guess, a restaurant such as ours, there's also, you know, the commitment to work with someone like me uh, and people like us who who want the best flavour as well. You know, we're not just growing things. So always there's a discussion with Nina about, you know, new and interesting methods to achieve the results that we would require, you know. So you can't buy, a, you can't just go out and buy a forced chicory because it hits the light and it changes. I mean, we see it change from when we pick it to when we see it, you know. So if you store that thing, you just never get to see it. So the only way to appreciate that food to either do it yourself and grow it or have someone, you know, serve it to you in a restaurant um, because it's a ridiculous thing, you know, and, and it really relies on the fact that there's a really, under, you know, very clear understanding of the biology of the plants, uh, but also an interest in the resulting flavour, you know. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a project. So this is, 
this is the main vegetable garden. Um, is it someone you might know over there, Pat Nurse? It's uh, Sean McManus here. Okay. Hi, Sean. He's got headphones on. He can't hear you. That's Pat Nurse. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess one of, the, one of the things in this period actually of being closed has been uh, the opportunity, and maybe some of them don't feel that way at the start, <laughs> but, but the opportunity for our floor and kitchen team in this period to spend lots of time working in the farm. So basically while we've been closed, uh, the majority of the team, uh, apart from a couple of us who've been working in the kitchen, have been working on the property, and that's hopefully why. Man, if you come to Bray at the moment, it's probably the best it's ever looked because we've had this ridiculous situation with this period at a time of year that really requires work. Um, we've had basically, you know, around a dozen people at times working in the garden, pulling out all this shitty stuff that's done with laying out mulch, pruning trees, you know, just doing basic farm maintenance, you know, things that might take years to get to, like cleaning up fence lines before summer and, you know, branches, low-hanging branches and all these types of things that you need to consider. I mean, we're a restaurant that has to consider, you know, our fire plan every summer. So, you know, just getting organised. So it's, um, and I'm hoping, and I think it's true, I think most of them have got a real uh, new, well, not newfound, but hopefully just an understanding now and respect for the amount of work that goes into the property, you know, I think sometimes could easily be taken for granted that this, you know, this exists, you know, and, and in the last seven years, I think we've done something at least interesting in the restaurant, but for me personally, the, the effort and the time spent and the, and the way the grounds have improved and the way that we've improved the quality of food that we grow and the diversity of food we grow and, and all the, you know, all the people that encompass, I think that's a real, that's a real, that's a real part of, of Bray, which is uh, important and certainly, yeah, it's certainly for us, it's for Jules and I, it's certainly the part we're most proud of. Um, so yeah, so might seem counterintuitive to be watering the garden at this time of year, but it's funny, it's, um, yeah, it still happens, it still happens. We're putting in seedlings at this time of year, even though it's, um, you know, even when you're transplanting from the polytunnel to the to the main garden, and, and we are expecting rain, but certainly um, they certainly need to still water them in. So, but our orange bean is up to that. It's actually quite good. Sean can't hear me at all, and I can't tell if you can hear me because he's sort of smirking there. <laughs> we're um we're on our last two minutes, Dan. Okay. Well, that's pretty heads much. Up. I mean, as I say, this is the main veggie garden, where where if you eat it, Bray, the majority of apart from obviously the citrus and the fruit and the wheat, this is where all the vegetables come from. Um, it's only you know, it's about two hundred meters from the dining room. Um, and it's funny, it's, you know, it's each year we get, we try and squeeze another little patch in. Um, and I guess, you know, just quickly, the self-sustaining thing you're talking about, our intention is not to be, you know, 100% self-sustainable. I mean, we're surrounded by farmers who grow excellent food and I want to support them. And living in a small community, you should always, you know, support other growers because, you know, you spend money with them, they spend money with you and it stays in the local economy. And we're really, you know, we feel it's really important, particularly now, the way the world is, it's super important to support local economy. So we're really happy to support our local growers. Um, but having said that, I mean, it's certainly something about harvesting, planting food, designing a menu around it, harvesting that food, and then serving it. And the, I guess it might be audacious at times, but to serve some of the single ingredients sometimes, and have them melt down in the dining room um, because of flavour and probably because of the, the fact that we serve someone something so simple. That for me is like, that's the ultimate for me in cooking, I reckon, to be able to serve very, very, very minimal ingredients but have them full powered with flavour and know that they're nutrient dense is, um, yeah, if that was a summary, that should be it, I reckon. 
Perfect. I'm going to get in with my super quick fine print and say, you can catch me speaking to Chris Ying here at three o'clock. The, the Melbourne Food Wine Festival is supported by the Bank of Melbourne and Visit Victoria. Thank you very much, Dan Hunter. Goodbye.